Uh, my talk is about a section of the canal at Reading, which I know it's only a very short section. It has got lots of history on it. Um, what took me here is I'm the, the chairman or your head Wollstone Community Council and have been for 30 many years. <clears throat> and in our patch is the Reading pit disaster. Bear in mind. Um, so I know there's a nice monument. You, as, you're breaking up a wee bit. Um, if, you, if you can try and speak sort of fairly slowly, that might help. Right. It's saying that my connection's unstable and that it shouldn't be because it's meant to be 112 megabytes, so. <laughs> okay, I'll try and be a bit clearer. Um, yeah, I would say I'm the convener of the community council here and the Reading Pit is in our area and that was a very bad disaster, but there's a monument there that tells you nothing about it. So we decided we'd like to do something telling people the story and at the same, along came this organization to build a huge um, store in Reading. And I got some connections and they got funding. And as I started digging into the information, found there was an awful lot more actually along the stretch of canal. So I'm going to take you on a, a short tour here. Now, I know that some of you have never been out of Lynn but uh, just west of Lynn Pullman Station. Up from that is the canal. I'm going to give you. It's about one and a quarter miles, one and a half miles, and ends up at what I'm being politically correct called the Tinks Camp. So all is here. This is um, what at one time, this picture we reckon is taken about 1950, and it was used by coal after this yard. Looks much nicer now, it's all been cleaned up. But what a lot of people don't realize is there's a hole in the wall here. And this actually was a stone, the stone quarry uh, key taking stone into Edinburgh. And this little opening, which everyone, the coal merchants, uh, Hauf or something, is actually a tunnel. And that runs up underneath the road here, under Main Street Brightons, into the quarry. The quarry was uh, shut <coughs> in 1930s. And is now up. So I'm going to move along slightly. And a bit further along, just to the west of uh, Pullman Station, there used to be what was the Fourth Bridge um, Steelworks. Now, when they were building the Fourth Bridge, at various railheads along the way, on both north and south of the, the Fourth, they had yards where they'd done some of the prefabrication. And then that was then moved on to. Um, to the, for, to the south and uh, works for the fourth bridge. Bear in mind, <coughs> it's not the fourth rail bridge because there was no other bridge across the estuary. So it's the fourth bridge. And this was operated by Arnold, Arnold the William Arnold, Arnold's brother, uh, and he owned the farm round about. And when the bridge was completed in 1892, they sold on the land. And it was taken over by another uh, steel company uh, called W.C. Robinson. And I found one, only one real, two mentions of them. One was that in, in the Falkirk Herald in 1892, they were advertising for a boy from Hammer. They were all into health and safety then. Um, sadly, they went into liquidation in 1914. And I imagine that on a bit longer, they would have probably got some First World War work. So we're going to move along a bit further. And between the canal and the railway is hard. Um, at the moment, you'll see there's some, if you go along there, there is various uh, quarter cabins, etc., that were used with the, the location of the, of the railway line. Um, this was operated by the North British Railway, or NBR. Uh, it was a locomotive sheds. There was two main rail companies in the area. North British Railway, which is no better runner, NBR, there's Caledonia Railway, CR, Canny Run. Um, it was a great place for all the boys to play. And, and I've, I've spoken to quite a few people. Every time I do these talks, I'll get a bit more information. And they used to every now and again, the yard foreman would bring them down here. 
I can't, I can't stop you coming in here. It was before the days of Hercus fencing, etc. So I used to give them a safety talk. And one of the things is, do not, do not go between wagons because you never know there's going to be a wagon moving about six up and you're killed. But they used to help the, the guys there and they had a manual turntable and they used to help push this around the farm. It was great fun. But this engine, this locomotive, actually has got quite a bit of history to it. Um, war. The rail company sent um, locomotives out to the front and when they, the, when they came back, they were all given names that were connected to the war. This one, you can't really see it, but on this plate here is the name, and it's Allenby. Um, and they, they named them after people through the First World War, locations, etc. The only other one I know that remains is Maud, which is down at the Bowness. So we're going to move along. And you'll see this horrible brick construction. Um, it's now blocked up. It used to be used for lots of fun and games. This is actually a meter house. The canals were not um, just a means of transport, but a lot of the actual funds actually for supplying water to industry. And they used to obviously sell it and they would charge them by the, I suppose it would be the cubic yard, I suppose, in these days. Um, so that's, that's one of the, it's a modern historic thing on the canal. And I'll show you later one of the, the, the pieces industry I think it was used for. So <clears throat> we're going to move on a wee bit further and anyone walking the canal will be familiar with this large concrete wall. This is Tushin, it's a Paul Bostel or the Young Offenders Institution, although these days it is more than just uh, a Bostel. Oh, the, I don't know if any of you really know the name where the name Bostel come from, but the first young person's prison in Britain was actually in a village here in Rochester, Chatham, etc., in Kent, and it was called Boston. So that's where you get that name from. Um, um, there was also another very famous institute, Blair Lodge School. Now, Blair Lodge School was a private school or a public school. I never quite understood, but I'm sure that some people will be able to tell me. Uh, it was originally founded, not in the form as you see there, but originally founded in 1841 by the Reverend John Cunningham, and he was very much involved with the Free Church of Scotland. Uh, there is a boy's account in the National Library from 854, and this must have been a horrific place to actually be a pupil. They were, the, most of the pupils were sons of uh, uh, men in the colonial service out in India, etc., etc., and most of the people who went there would have gone off to the military service, and that's such like things. However, in 1874, this man, Dr. Cook Gray, took on the school. He turned this school round. It was a world, basically a world-leading school. They specialised in scientific and technical, whereas most private schools tend to be classics, etc. Um, he even had an annex in Dusseldorf, would you believe? Um, and it, was, it used to vie with the likes of um, Eaton, um, Fetus, all these other big names that you know. And it, these are pictures I'm going to show you which were taken in 88. And one of the things you will notice there is these. Bear in mind, this is 1888. It's a it had about 900 electric lights and they produced their own electricity. Um, the, at the same year, the council were actually demonstrating this wonder of the age electricity at this. Oh God. You still hearing me? You yeah. still hearing me, John? Yeah, yes, okay. I'll yeah, come, yeah. Up, we'll come up with a funny message there. Right. Uh, and also, the, that was the same year that Falker first gas lighting. Um, it, they had carving tables to keep the, the roast one. They had a dishwasher. It didn't mean plates, it meant actual silver plate. They had um, golf teams, golf clubs, cricket clubs. They had their own nine hole golf. Uh, this is their joinery workshop. And one of the things you'll probably notice in here is the windows on both sides, how it was all lit. 
and it was very well kitted. And I'll come to a wee bit about the, the uniform. The uniform was the uh, colours were black, red, and grey. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, this is a metal workshop, again, very well lit, and it's got machinery in there that would any probably engineering box would be proud to have. Uh, this is their, their gym. You'll all recall, if you've been working around the industry, that in the last 40 years or so, all that got built had an atrium in it. This is 1888. Atriums are old hat to now. Um, and this is where you got all the, the light. They are the great sports teams, as I said, and this is our gymnastics team. Uh, I've tried to do a wee bit of research on the, some of the pupils, and I found a couple that were interesting. This guy, Friedrich Lindemann, he was actually born in Baden-Baden, Germany, and he ultimately became Churchill's uh, tall and, um, advisor and confidant and advisor during the Second World War. And it was him that actually came up, and which is a bit contradictory came up with the idea of blanket, blanket bombing which they'd done in Dresden. Um, he ultimately became Viscount Chernobyl and he headed up the UK Atomic Energy Authority. The other one that I've come across uh, is this man, Sir John James Burnett. He was part of an architectural family, his father was the same name, and you'll recognise at least a few of the buildings that he'd done. This one, which is Charing Cross in, in Glasgow, his, his stuff seems to be quite sort of ornamental. Um, he was involved in the, the stonework part of the city of Harwich, for science stores in Edinburgh, Selfridges in London. Um, if you go down to Grangemouth, he actually designed the war memorial, which is the, the, the British lion crushing the German uh, eagle. <clears throat> However, the school... <coughs> Excuse me. School suffered a smallpox outbreak and they went into financial difficulties and it was closed in 1908. At the time, the prison service were looking for somewhere for a, a, a young person's unit or a hostel and they bought it in 1911 and they moved their first pupils in in, 19, in December that year. Um, one of the things that they done it uh, when the first one World War come round, some of the, the inmates were allowed to serve in the armed forces and you know, that would basically be part of their service sentence. Um, ugly, there's a, there is a big ledger in, in the in the hostel and it lists all the names of the pupils, or not the pupils, the, the inmates, uh, and where they went and where the, most of them, where they were killed. It's quite a sad bit of um, paperwork. This is a, this is a bridge in around about uh, 1925, um, the canal is running along here. This is one of, one of those two main, sorry, and this is uh, the HM building, and this is the original Blair Lodge house. Excuse me a second. Um, sadly, Blair Lodge house was pulled down when they'd done the reconstruction, and this is a picture taken in 2010 when they finished spending on, on the hostel um, and the, the, the capacity is about 850 although these days it's about 500 and something and this building this one here is called Blair Lodge and that's used or Blair House and that is used by uh, female offenders as I mentioned about uniform right opposite is a school called the Blair um, Bray's High School School. The Brace High School, when it first started up, was actually quite a horrific place. And I used to joke there was actually a tunnel went between the two. But the other connection, it just happens, it's total uh, um, coincidence, but their school, school colours are the same colours as Blair Lodge School of black, grey. This area here has now got 370 houses on it. This area here has got 900 houses. Houses on it, 700 houses. This is the Tesco is actually under construction. <clears throat> so we're going to move on a wee bit more. Um, but as all you may know, have a gas, as Americans would call it, a gas station. Well, that's exactly what used to be roughly in that same 
same spot there was a gas work and that's one of the areas that actually they use water from the canal in some of the processes so we'll move on a wee bit more and if you stand in it you'll see this telephone mast well roughly where this telephone mast was was where the ready pit was it was one of the largest producers in central scotland <clears throat> um one of our members is done a, a survey and barge 10 on November 1839 from this pit moved 235 tons of coal. But to give you an idea, there was about 84 barges used to go through on Lithgow every week at that time. However, the Reading Pit is more famous for, well, thing, sorry, one of the things is uh, they used to have a puggy and there's a bridge, a swing bridge across the canal. I don't know when a swing bridge across the canal or it's closed, but this puggy had a, a life of its own. And it was often apparently seen with the, the, the engine driver running after it trying to catch a cough. Whether this happened on this occasion, we don't know. But I met a miner or a guy who had actually joined the, the pit in 1945 at the age of 14 or 15 as an apprentice electrician stroke joiner. And when I showed them that picture, he reckons this was taken in the mid 30s. And he said, see him there, I don't know which one it was now, but see him there, he was a right bugger to deal with. And this is where the pit, where that, that uh, swing bridge used to. At the moment, somebody's hit that stone, it's a great, it's a great um, navigation problem and it's sitting at 90 degrees, but this, most, um, the, what they've done is that they took the track of the coal out at the colliery and then went across to the, the south side of the canal and it was loaded onto barges. Now, most keys where they loaded uh, coal on were actually higher so that they dropped the coal straight in from the, the wagons into the, or the, the little puggy things that they used, straight into the barges. As the barges sunk, then they went or went down and this one, this is actually just above the normal water level. But the, pit, the Reading Pit is more famous for this, the Reading Pit disaster. And in the, this picture, you can actually see where the swing bridge was. They did have a, a, some sort of bing or some sort on this side, but the bulk of their, their bing was on the south side of the canal. It happened on the 25th of September, 1923. And it was an inrush of water on what the called the Dublin section, which is out for the colliery. Um, most, some of the miners had been saying to the management, you know, there's water seeping in, there's water seeping in, and they're saying, oh, it's rubbish, there's nothing happening. Of course, nobody listens to the person at the coalface, do they? And sadly, 66 men were trapped. 21 of them within five hours. The conditions down there were horrendous. Um, and the men that worked in there were were from the ages of 15, 70. This is some of the scenes you saw. You may remember, oh, we've gone back about 10, 11, 12 years now, the Chilean mine disaster with all the families. This is the kind of scenes that were to be seen. Uh, this, is near the, this is near the actual welfare building, which is roughly about the back of where Tesco is now. And the other one, which is, was a ventilation shaft called the gutter hole, which is behind Reading Muir Head. But there is reports that the disaster drew huge numbers. It was estimated that around 70,000 came to the pit head. Roads were impassable and the station was overcrowded. Well, that's something we'll never see again because it's been closed. Um, on the 4th of October, five were rescued after nine days. Some 40 perished. 11 survived, they reckon, for at least up to about 14 days. And they left uh, letters to the family now I've never properly but amongst it, it says uh, be good to your mum be good to your mother and things like that but I can't really read it I'm afraid um, and something about eight days um, I've never actually seen the originals of that the last body was recovered on the further this after the disaster and the pit was reopened again in the January immediately following it <clears throat> There is, a, as I say, a lovely memorial down there at Reading. Um, and if you actually look at the names, you'll see that a lot of the names 
are of the sons because what you had in minds in these days was fathers, sons, brothers, etc. This name here in the center is <clears throat> Scott Irving. I was caught while I was doing this, I got contacted by a lady who said her, her grandfather, let me get this right, her grandfather had been killed. There. And it turned out that her grandfather had been killed, but her mother was, her mother was still alive. And this is the lovely lady, Janet Mackey. Now, when we done this research, we found out, as I said, there was a lot more, and Tesco's funded us, and we got this patient panel put up in the Tesco's. And Janet was 94. Her daughter thought, well, I don't know if she would actually do it. I asked her if she would open it. Anyway, Janet lady, and she came along, and just uh, after the, we did the, the, the unveiling, um, uh, Janet for um, Central FM. Now, I would suggest you do have your hankies ready. 94-year-old Janet Mackey did the honours of opening the panel. She lost her father in the 1923 disaster when water from an adjacent abandoned coal mine broke through into the pit. As a young child, she remembers waiting by it, hoping her dad would be saved. Well, I was just a wee girl and there was crowds. I think the whole area were down there standing just standing waiting for news there were a lot of rescuers down that hole and we were just waiting for them to come up and hoping that they would bring your own ones up and they did bring people up, they went away in ambulances and, and we were left standing and had to go home again and wait and, and be down in, again in the morning 66 men were trapped in the pit. 21 escaped that day and a further five workers were rescued after nine days. Those trapped had to cope with massive and sudden rushes of water, rocks and debris falling, black damp and exhaustion in their struggle to survive. But sadly, 40 men lost their lives. Notes were found on those who perished. They'd written to their families, first in hope of rescue and then to say goodbye. Janet remembers those final days of waiting. You couldn't get near it for people and they were just waiting for for the men to bring somebody else up. I was just a wee girl and I didn't, I wasn't told who they were bringing up. But when we had to go home, then I knew my dad was there. It was, it was horrible. We were standing there holding on to each other and just waiting on somebody saying, that's Jimmy Irv. And never came, never came. After the disaster, Janet and her pregnant mother were left to deal with the grief of losing a husband and a father. They were also left without any financial support, and had it not been for a fund that was quickly established days after, they would have been left penniless. Over £60,000 was raised, the equivalent of £1 million today. It left us without no dad. My mum had a big struggle. The people all round about were so generous, sending donations into from this fund they would distribute enough for us to keep going to keep alive we just had no support unless that money and we were grateful to all the people people all over the world had heard about this terrible accident uh, as is the one these days but Alfred Nobel, he took over the, the pit, uh, the, the, sorry, the pit, the chemical works, and it was changed to the Nobel Works, and that was about 1876. Very few people know that Alfred Nobel actually used to live in Lauriston, just before the, the one left beside the Falkirk, and he actually had a house there called Hawthorne Cottage, and he stayed at least about three months a year. Now, had Grabby Burns been there, had a drink and had a woman, there'd be a pl plaque on it. But house, and yet I've always found also strange Alfred Nobel, the Nobel Priest Prize, is quite contradictory considering he used to su uh, supply for wars, etc. But there you are. Um, as I said, there's no, no there's no mention of Nobel anywhere in Falkirk other than my small street, which is Nobel View. The original works were on the north side of the canal. And then when they took over, they, they were expanding. They moved over to the 
and they built a foot bridge and also uh, and, and also the swing bridge, which is still there to this day. Um, it was a great place to work. Um, the only aerial picture I ever found of this was actually one taken for the Luftwaffe, and this is a Nobel box here because they flew over and they took pictures of various targets, etc. As happens, coincidences, I was telling one of my friends that I was doing, what I was doing, how this, with this project. And he said, oh, we used to go to, um, we used to go to South, uh, South Germany to the Black Country or the Black Forest camping when he was a kid. And the guy there that run the campsite, he told us we took all the, for the Luftwaffe of Scotland for targets. So we actually know this picture was taken by a, called, a guy called Frank Mayer. Coincidence is coincidence. Um, it was a great place to work. It was mainly women. Second World War was 1800. Very dangerous place to work. That never any catastrophes. So you don't see much in the papers if you do searches. But there was, you know, very, you know one person killed, two people killed. Although this is brick, a lot of the buildings were timber. The idea being that if they blew up, there wouldn't be so much masonry flying around. But I, I think if you had a, a sharp ear of timber flying through, it's probably do more damage than a brick hitting you. <laughs> um, I love this picture, which is the group of danger one top unit. And this guy must have had a grand time. The only guy in the picture. Uh, they all had to wear these uniforms of hair drips, etc., because if they fell, and caused the spark, then the whole place would go bang. Um, they used to, as I was saying, a place to work, they had the welfare, they had Christmas parties, and anybody in the area who had an auntie, cousin, whatever, the odd uncle, I suppose, as well, who worked was trying to get an invite because the parties were apparently the highlight of the year. They even had their director's bars. Now, you know that what Tesco is as now, is that used to be a Nobel Works as well. And this is the director's bars that used to go between the two. I've never identified which bridge this is, but maybe someone will because the, the keystone number is just out the top of the picture, I'm afraid. So this was uh, apparently 19. So there is a connection between the Nobel Works there and the Nobel Works obviously in Long Lifco. Another is that's, that's what you was pre two days. And this is when the bridge used to be across. We used to do the canal marathons. And this is um, two of our members through the boat. Bob's about to lose his head there because there's a big beam just underneath that. So if you ever get a chance to go along to the canal or Tesco's at Reading, um, you'll now find the, the information panel plunked at the far end. But as you all like your beer, your wine, your spirits, it's just Tesco's. So... Thanks for bearing with me. I hope you managed to hear it. Sorry you couldn't hear the, the talk that was done by Janet. Um, if you've got any questions, thanks for uh, I'm pleased to answer them. You, you mentioned the electricity that was generated for the lighting etc. at the private school. Can you tell me how they generated the electricity? Uh, do you want me to go and take the book and read it? I don't, know, I don't know how they generated it. I don't know how they done it. It certainly wasn't water power because there wasn't any um, you know, water. Danny, I, as, as you know, I, I was, as I said earlier, I was uh, lived in, in, actually on the main street in Reading for a bit. Uh, and I was, I was fascinated by the monument down the road. And I noticed that while we were there, uh, what, what I think was a lodge, but I think it was uh, associated with miners and with the mining disaster, had a parade every year up the main street. <coughs> that still happened. Yeah. I don't know, was it connected? Yeah, with it, it's, uh, I can't have an exact title, but we call them the Free Colliers. Uh, the, the Free Colliers were basically almost like a union, but the, they were, the miners were not allowed to have unions. And they, they were all over the country. I think they were all over Europe as well. 
uh, and they were all they were basically the short name was the three colliers and how they actually used to join hands with the masons have got their handshake they hold pinkies mm. I think you see that but they actually hold pinkies and they do on the first Saturday of August every year they go up to the Wallace <coughs> Monument at the top of Wallace Stone uh, but they, and they pray and they lay a wreath at the Wallace Monument at the, the monument at um, Reading so they have to do that every year um, it's as far as I'm aware, it is the last three colliers left in the world, um, and they're still. I think it's uh, I can't mind the full name, but yes, they're still obvious, and they meet twice a month as well, but not at the moment, obviously. Um, am I right in thinking that Alfred Nobel's house is um, still there in Lauderston Main Street, just before the small, the mini yes, roundabout it. on the left-hand side as you're going in? That's yeah. correct, David. It's the last house. As you're going into Lauriston, you come, there's a um, last small house before the height. There's about three, so uh, five, six story flats on the left hand side. You're quite correct. Thank you very much, Danny. I found that fascinating. I, when Thank I, you. When I first saw Thank you. That's wandering up the road. Uh, marching but with their little fingers interlinked it did look very strange and I wondered what the background to that was <laughs> and you certainly uh, filled that filled that in nicely now thank you 